assalamu alaikum. Uh, you know, my name is Michael. Um, thank you for having me. Um, about four years ago, um, Dr. Uh, Yasser Qadi uh, was on uh, the show, Muhammad Hijab, uh, reacting to some leaked emails. Um, and this has been, you know, constant videos have been made about this um, since then. Now, um, what I had done is I made a presentation to how I would have answered the question. So I'm going to start that. Um, let me share my screen. Um, so can you see, can you see it? Yeah. Yes. All right. So, so the first thing I wanted to uh, clarify is what this presentation is and what it's not. Okay, so this is not intended to criticize or defame either Yes or Qadi or Muhammad Hijab. Um, you know, they're both, uh, you know, Muslims and human beings that are trying to do their best. Um, but what this presentation is, it's an attempt to answer the questions asked in the famous uh, video conversation and provide more details. Uh, so to reference this conversation, um, you know, I put a link in this presentation. Um, and we could put the link in the description. So before I go into the discussion, um, I wanted to share early 7th century Quranic manuscripts, uh, three in particular, the Birmingham manuscript, uh, the Tübingen manuscript, um, it's German, so I don't, you know, even though I have ancestors that speak German, I don't, and the Sinai manuscript. Um, the Birmingham Quran, um, this one is located in the United Kingdom. Uh, the parchment has been carbon dated to 548 to 645 of the common arrow with 95.4% accuracy. It is not a palimpsest, so it's an original writing. So a palimpsest is a piece of parchment that was erased and then rewritten over, reused, because animal skins um, were very hard to come by. And so it took a long time to make them to write. So sometimes people would reuse them, but this is not that. So this is an original. Um, parchments are often used shortly after being made, ready due to the difficulty to make these. So script analysis on top of the um, carbon dating would um, allow the dating of this to be between 625 and 655 CE. So this, it's very early on. Um, and it's not a complete Quran, but it's excerpts from chapter 18 through 20. And we can compare them to the Qurans in existence today. So here, um, you'll see some screenshots um, taken from Wikimedia Commons of the actual manuscript itself. The next is the Tubingen Quran fragment, and I'm not really sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, this one is located in Germany, in the town, um, the University of Tubingen. It's been, it was carbon dated in Zurich, the 649 to 675 of the Common Era, so it's the second oldest. Um, carbon dating is 95.4% accurate. Um, and I'll put images from medievalhistories.com on the following two slides. So here is part of the Tubingen Quran, and then here's you know, the other part of it, it's a fragment. And then we have the Sana manuscript. It's carbon dated to 671 of the Common Era. It's the third oldest that we have it, that we know of at the moment. Um, it is a palimpsest. Uh, it was discovered and is located in Yemen. Um, and a photo can be found on the next slide from Wikimedia Commons. And I'll discuss this one a little later, but here is a um, photograph of the Sanaa manuscript. Now, conclusions from the early manuscripts. Um, the Quran was preserved in both oral and manuscript form. Uh, the evidence is from the primary documents, and this is not controversial. However, the rest of the presentation may provide information that has not been heard before by many. Uh, some Muslims do not share this because they fear it will cause doubt in people's faith. Uh, my position is, if Islam is true, facts should not shake your faith because it's immature, grow, and deepen. Um, and if facts shake your faith, um, then your faith had a weak foundation to begin with. And next, we're in the internet era. The information is out there and not talking about subjects causes more harm than talking about them. So this is um, important to frame the conversation. The Islam of scholarship versus the Islam of laymen. 
Um, and I think that this is where a lot of um, the controversy came in um, regard, um, out of this conversation. Uh, you know, when I heard it, it didn't really cause any controversy with myself, um, but I saw, you know, it caused a lot of um, negative reactions towards Dr. Yasser Qadi early on. Um, see, the Islam of laymen is people generally learn one historical narrative and they learn one mode of recitation and they learn one introductory legal text quite often. And then, you know, they just move on and practice. Um, then you have the Islam of a classical scholarship, which depending upon your level and attainment and the direction you're going in of study, you learn different historical narratives with the evidences um, you learn differences between modes of recitations along with their variants. Uh, you learn comparative legal texts with methods of drawing conclusions. Now, the Islam of the students of knowledge, you know, might be someone who has like a bachelor's from an Islamic university. Uh, it, it's dependent upon the level of attainment and direction. You can fall anywhere between the student and the, um, between the layman and the scholar, I meant to say. So this is not unique to Islam before we go any further. So if, if you go in, in Christian seminaries, um, many of them are teaching the historical critical methods. You know, however, if you go to a, a Sunday school or a weekly mass, this is not what's being taught. Um, students in introductory physics course, they're not really taught conflicting cosmological models along with the evidences for or against. High school math students, they're not taught P versus NP problem or the Riemann hypothesis. So like every field of study has advanced problems that are difficult to solve or unsolved at this point. And Islam is a field of study and the Ahruf versus the Kira'a is one of Islam's hard problems. Hard problems does not mean something is false, right? No one denies all the laws of physics because we do not have certainty in our cosmological models. No one denies all mathematics because they cannot solve the Riemann hypothesis or the P versus the NP problem. So the Quran preservation, and this is where a lot of the controversy came up, classical scholarship versus layman, right? So all Muslims agree that the Quran is preserved um, and the earlier manuscripts demonstrate preservation. Um, the definition and understanding of preservation is where they differ, right? It's so like to the lay person, they've only learned one mode. So their regional Quran is the one that goes directly back to the Prophet Muhammad, may God bless and grant peace in that exact form. The student of knowledge applies the same concept, but to the 20 transmissions, and they narrate the Hadith literature explaining, but many often do not go beyond that. So Muslims who are advanced scholars of exegesis, manuscript traditions, or jurisprudence go deeper, but traditionally did not teach this to the masses. Um, and they, the challenge faced is that like academia um, has no such restrictions. You know, in general, non-Muslims don't have these restrictions. Like, they they'll study whatever they want to study. There's, you know, um, and they'll study our traditional sources and they'll discuss the findings with whoever. Um, so they're not playing by the same rule set. So someone who's at an advanced level in jurisprudence, um, exegesis, or history has a different understanding of what preserve means. So to the one who studied classical Islamic scholarship on this issue, the Quran has been preserved through 10 canonical recitations, through 20 canonical transmitters, over a historical period, and through a historical process. And we haven't just preserved the canonical, we've also preserved the non-canonical as well, or many. And we use the non-canonical in exegesis and jurisprudence to provide clarifications on meanings um, and legal issues. Um, now, those, the non-canonical have been graded, um, some of them have been graded as authentically transmitted, but not continuously transmitted, or were accepted by major scholars, but not the consensus of the Muslims. So all 20 canonical transmissions are Quran. Um, they agree upon roughly 97.5% of words and disagree on roughly 2.5%. Now you can test this claim. My numbers might not be accurate, but you can go check for yourself. And I'm going to show you how. You can either purchase, or you can look up online one book from each transmission, and I'll tell you the transmissions later, and read them side by side. Every time there's a difference, write it down. 
Then you divide the differences by the total number of words in the Quran. So there's 77,000 plus words in the Quran. Um, the majority of differences do not affect the meanings. However, some do. Um, some have words, others do not. And I'm, you'll see that in the next slide. Um, and this is totally accepted by classical scholarship. Um, you can also refer to the Bridges translation of the Quran, which I provide a link to and provide it in the description. And so the Bridges translation of the Quran, you know, will um, have the variants and English will have footnotes and at the bottom they'll tell you, what, you know, what the variant is and, you know, what rest, what transmissions they appear in. So if we look at this Quran variant here, this is, um, you know, in the Hafs version, which is at our time is the most famous version, but wasn't always, um, you'll see, you know, Allahu al ganyu, right? Um, but in the Warsh version, it's just Allahu al ganyu, right? And uh, also, there, you know, the verses are slightly numbered different. So you see the word huwa, which is he, appears in Hafs, but it doesn't appear in Warsh. So the history of the, we have to go into the history of the Quranic canonization from the Uthman afterwards. So according to the traditional narrative, the seven letters Ahruf caused confusion amongst some of the Muslims that led to fighting. So in order to alleviate the confusion, um, Uthman collected the Quran into one harf. Now that also, that's the dominant, but there's also a difference of opinion about that. Um, the dialect of the Quraysh in the Hijazi script was the um, the harf, the letter that he chose, and he ordered the burning of all other Qurans written in different letters. So this is the majority of the position, but not agreed upon. So I um, hyperlinked um, articles from um, Yaqeen that discussed this issue, Yaqeen Institute, which discussed this issue more in detail. So now this is important. His Quran was written without vowels, diacritical marks, um, diacritical marks are dots that differentiate consonants, um, consonants. And the letter is Aleph, which is like our English letter A, Wow, which is like our English letter W, or Yeah, which is our English letter Y, or the guttural stop, um, Hamza. So he then made copies and sent them to major cities. So the classical scholars differ over how many cities and copies there were. Some say four cities, some say five cities, some say seven cities, some say 12 cities. Reality is no one knows for certain how many cities they were sent to. Um, I'm going to use a seven city model for this presentation um, just because it fits neatly. So here's a visual for the continental skeleton. And this is something um, like I made up. Now, some variants may not be accurate. So this is imperfect teaching model to convey a message. So we see you know, this continental skeleton uh, here at the um, top. So this is what this word could look like um, in the Arabic of the time. Now the first letter can be fa, which is our English letter F, or pof, which is our English letter Q. So if you look here down below with the diacritical marks, the same letter, what it would look like. One dot is an F, two dots a Q, but there were no dots in the original. Now the next letter can be ha, let's take a and like the English letter H, but if like you burnt your hand on the stove and you're like hot, like, you know, um, the next letter Jim, which is like our English letter J or Kha, which is like a KH, like is in, um, you know, the MMA star Khabib. Um, and we could see no dots, it's Ha. A dot underneath, it's Jim or J. And a dot above is Kha or, or KH. And the last letter can be written as um, Ra, which is our English letter R, or Zai, which is like our English letter Z if you're in America, or Z if you're in England. Um, and we see here, you know, no dots, it's an R, and one dot, it's a Z. Um, also, you know, since a lot of the wow, yeah, or A are not included, I use an example here, and just put an extra um, Aleph, which a, um, which also, you know, could come from this continental skeleton. So, and those are just some of the um, ways. So, you know, to read it at that time, you know, you would have to really know uh, 
the difference. You know, it's much more challenging to read the Arabic of the seventh century than it is to read the Arabic of today. So now we have the, I drew this diagram, um, the Arifmanic continental skeleton. I, I went into the dated manuscripts and also um, there were codices of Ibn Saud, Ubay Ibn Kab, which, and also there were variant readings of Aisha and Hafsa, which were preserved in um, Hadith, but they don't appear in the um, in our manuscripts. So the Ibn Mas'ud and Ubay Ibn Kab, um, we can find some, we preserve some of their uh, variants in our Tafsir tradition. And you also can find some of them in the lower text of the palimpsest of the Sana manuscript. Uh, a variant reading by Ishan Hafsa. So we have an ayah of Quran. says, guard your prayers, especially the middle prayer. Um, Aisha's um, recitation was, guard your prayers, especially the middle prayer and the Asr prayer. Um, that was preserved, but it's not preserved in you know our current manuscripts. So you know this was early on, um, but when um, Oth Man. Um, made a continental skeleton, you know, the Uma overall went with his continental, continental skeleton. Um, now, the, I use this, these seven cities, um, Baghdad, Basra, Damascus, Hadramaut, Kufa, Mecca, Medina. Now, Hadramaut, Baghdad, some people would say, um, no, it's Bahrain and Egypt. You know, no one really knows. Before, when we get into the the accepted modes and transmissions later that were canonized, you know, you'll see why I use these cities. But then you see copies were sent, let's say copies were sent to these seven cities. They were sent without the, um, the you know, in the form that I shared earlier, without the Aleph, well, yeah, Hamza, um, without diacritical marks. And so this had led to Ijtihad. Um, Ijtihad is independent reasoning. Um, in when two copyists and reciters were both exercising this, um, and this was accepted at the time, um, and then they influence each other, and so th this is where a lot of the um, variants we have in our current text um, come from. Now, the, the hadith about the seven, the Quran, and seven ahruf, um, according to the majority opinion, that was pre Uthman. And then Uthman made it into one Ahru. Now, some people differ with that. You know, and this is, goes back to, you know, this is an unsolved hard problem of Islam, just like there are unsolved hard problems in every field of study. And, uh, you know, they mix and influence each other. So in nine, um, Ibn Mujahid, who died in 936 of the Common Era, canonized um, seven from five cities, I believe, four or five cities, but his canonization did not reach a consensus. Um, now, Ibn al Jazari, who died in 1429 of the Common Era, canonized 10 from seven cities, which reached a, a consensus. And I use the seven cities that um, Ibn al Jazari um, uses here. So without diacritical marks or vowels, both reciters and copyists had to use independent reasoning. And some variants are based upon the ijtihad of the reciter and the copyist. They mutually influence each other. Um, and during the classical period, the independent reasoning of the reciter was similar to the independent reasoning of the jurist or the exegete. Um, and originally variants were regional, they could be traced, but then reciters began to travel, learn from each other and influence each other so it's during this period we see modes of recitation begin to blend. However, the majority were still regionally based. Um, I mentioned, you know, Ibn Mujahid and Ibn Jazari. So now I'm going to mention the transmissions on the next slide. So we have Nafi'i from Medina. He's transmitted through Warsh and Qalun. Um, we have Abu Jafar from Medina, um, transmitted through Isa ibn Rabban and Suleiman ibn Jumaz. We have Ibn Kathir from Mecca, not to be confused with Tafsir, the author of Tafsir, Ibn Kathir, who came much later. Um, transmitted for Al-Bazar and Umbolt. And this, at one time, was the most popular recitation of the Quran, even though it's a rare one now. Um, Abu Amr from Basra, 
transmitted through Adori and Asusi. And that also was one of the most popular recitations earlier on, which it's not as popular today. Um, Ibn Amr from Syria transmitted through Hisham and Ibn Thakwan. Qasim from Kufa transmitted through Hafs, which is the most popular of today. And Shu'ba, uh, Hamza from Kufa transmitted through Khalaf and Khalad. Um, Al Kisa'i from Kufa transmitted through Al Layth and Ad Durian. Um, Khalaf from Baghdad transmitted through Al Waraq and Al Haddad. And Yaqub from Hadram al Yemen transmitted through Wais and Ibn Abdul Mu'min. And I know, you know, it might be controversial that I, you know, used Hadram al and Baghdad in my earlier. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, it's an imperfect model and I'm just using it for simplicity. So currently, Hafs from Asim is the dominant reading followed by Wars from Nafi. However, in the past at times, Ibn Kathir al Meki was dominant as well as Abu Hamr. Now, the classical Muslim position is Allah God, through his infinite wisdom, uh, decreed some to be more popular at different times due to reasons known to him, and it is in the best interest of the people at the time. So, Hafs is more popular today, um, according to this interpretation, because you know, that's what the Muslims need today. Um, Ibn Kathir al Meki was more popular when the Muslims needed his reputation. Abu Amr was more popular when the Muslims needed his rep, um, recitation. Now, that's a religious interpretation. Um, a secular scholar, you know, that wouldn't make sense to a secular scholar, but to a religious believer, you know, it does. Uh, in 1924, Al-Azhar recognized the printing of Hafs from Asim Quran. Uh, prior to that, Muslims had considered hand copying the Quran to be worship and printing the Qur'an as bad manners or bad adab towards the Qur'an, um, they viewed it as disrespectful the way the printing press, you know, smacked and slapped the letters on the pages is the way they viewed it. Um, but once, you know, the Muslims accepted um, the printing of the Qur'an, it wasn't the first printed Qur'an. There were printed Qur'ans that were done earlier, but they were done by non-Muslims in France. Um, but this was the first one accepted by the Muslims using the printing press. Before that, copies were a hand. Um, and this allowed Hafs to become popular today. Now, Yasser Qadi made a statement, the standard narrative as holes, which um, the Muslims jumped on him and he had to retract. Uh, and this caused a crisis for, of faith for some Muslims when he said that. Uh, but before I actually comment on this, we need to find our terms. It's like, what is a narrative? So a narrative is, is a story that explains a model. Um, and a model is a mental construct developed to explain a series of facts and evidence and data. So when all facts, evidence, and data are in absolute agreement, there is a consensus. Uh, so you, know, there, you don't need a narrative as much when there is a consensus. So a consensus can be an absolute consensus despite sectarian differences. So for example, the four or five uh, Sunni legal schools, the two Shia legal schools and the Ibadi legal schools agree upon the obligation of the performing the five daily prayers. So, so this is an absolute consensus. It's a consensus of all legal schools, regardless of sect, right? Um, then you can have a consensus within a branch, like for example, all Sunnis agree, or even a consensus within a legal school, you know, all, all Malikis agree. Um, so a consensus occurs when all facts and evidence are in total agreement. So when all facts and evidences are not in total agreement, you get what is called a conflict of evidence. And when there are conflicts of evidence, you get differences of opinion, ikhtilaf. So when there's a difference of opinion, a narrative is formed to explain or support one's explanation or opinion. So when there's a difference or opinion, no model or narrative supports 100% of the data. And if it did, there would be a consensus. So for visualization, let's say one has a set of 10 facts and evidence as data points with some of the evidence conflicting. A scholar will come up with an opinion or narrative to come up with their best explanation of the data. And this is not unique to Islam, this is in science as well. Um, some may explain some 
narratives or explanations might explain nine out of 10 facts, but one is missing. One doesn't add up. Some might eight out of 10, just two don't add up. Seven out of 10. However, none explain all 10. And this is why there is a difference of opinion. If a narrative could explain all 10, there would be a consensus. So all narratives where there is a difference of opinion have at least one hole in it, right? So, um, and guess what? The narrative I'm sharing with you today, it will have, you know, one or more holes in it too. Um, Yasser Qadi was asked if he was given a blank mushaf, um, which is like the text that the Quran is written on, um, can you construct the Quran? So, then, um, and, you know, he, you know, was apprehensive and understandably so about answering that question. So the 97.5% of agreed upon words, like, yes, no problem. But the 2.5% words where there are differences, like, how can you say with certainty how it was written in the original Uthmanic consonantal skeleton? So slide 18, remember I shared earlier, um, how the haps has the word huwa in it, and the warsh does not have the word huwa in it, and both readings were preserved. The Muslims accepted both, and according to classical Muslim scholarship, both are Quran from God. And this goes for the 20 transitions as well. But if you were gonna rewrite the Uthmanic continental skeleton, do you include the huwa, or do you not include the huwa? Um, now, Ibn al-Jazari has an explanation of this. Um, Ibn al-Jazari stated that Uthman had both written um, into the seven copies, depending upon region. So um, I think he said that the Huwa was written for the Syrian regions um, and the those without Huwa were for the Mecki and Medini regions. Um, and I could, you know, that's going from memory. I could be a little off there. Um, but this this works in a seven copy model, but it doesn't work in the four to five copy model promoted by Ibn Mujahid, right? So like there's no perfect narrative. Um, and it also conflicts the dominant opinion that Uthman reduced all ahruf to one heart or all you know letters to one letter. Um, now I've read, you know, people posing these questions after um, the Yasser Qadi speech on internet forums. And um, I've seen different ways that people have reacted um, or answers that laymen have tried to give. You know, so for example, someone said that someone said that the questioner who's asking the question doesn't understand the difference between letters ahruf and readings kiraat. You know, the problem with that answer, um, it was dismissive, but and I think that the brother who gave the answer was well intentioned. Um, but from a factual standpoint, no one does right so as sayuti narrated there are over 40 opinions of islamic scholarship now um that was in it pawn and it pawn as was translated into english at least over 15 years ago so this information is accessible in english um it's not easy to find and i'm not talking about the print version um but i'm talking about like the the lengthier version uh, you know, you may be able to still find a copy online somewhere, but it was, you know, much more prevalent, um, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago to find the Iqbal. Um, so if the best of the Islamic scholarship cannot come to a conclusion on the issue, it's doubtful that Muslims on Reddit, Quora, or Stack Exchange can. Um, someone said there are only seven recitations, right? But yet Islamic scholarship has accepted 10 recitations and 20 transmissions is canonical. Um, They've accepted, you know, al Jazari's since then. Um, and the problem is that most people receive the lay person's education and are trying to answer questions without referring back to classical scholarship. And the people answering these questions have never read the different transmissions. And it's obvious by their answers. And I mean, some people give like English and say, see, there's no difference between them. Like, but no one was talking about like English translations um, from Hafs, they were talking about the, you know, the various transmissions that I shared earlier. And these are difficult questions and people are giving oversimplified answers. Now, some people say they're just accents, um, but sometimes they're entirely different words. 
and all of the explanations uh, given by people account for some of the data and neglect other parts of the data. So for example, 4319, um, Quran 4319 has a different, completely different word in has versus worse. See the next slide. Um, you know, this was highlighted. So in um, Habs, it says Aibad or Rahman. I'm Aibad or Rahman. And in Warsh, it says Ainda or Rahman, right? So Aibad and Ainda are two different words. But if you look at them from the continental skeleton point of view, you can see, right? Like the Ba and the Noon would be written the same way in the Uthmanic continental skeleton. Um, but uh, so this in the Warsh, it's they are with the most compassionate or with the most merciful. And um, in the Hefs, it says they are the servants um, of the most merciful. They're servants of the most compassionate. Uh, so my advice is, you know, for people to learn this from classical sources, and these are just a couple of examples. Now, granted, um, from a Muslim perspective, is these meanings complement each other, right? So that um, this is referring to the angels. The angels are both with the most merciful, and they are servants of the most merciful. So they're both, you know, add to the meaning. Um, in this instance, um, but you know you can find others that are the explanation is much more challenging. Um, so it's much, this is a much deeper and more comprehensive issue than some of the simple explanations that people have given. Um, so my closing statements: the preservation of the Quran is understood differently at the level of scholarship, and it's very complex. Um, and there's no one answer from the Islamic perspective that can account for all of the available data up to this point. And that is okay, as this is common to all fields of study. And like I said earlier, we don't throw out mathematics because we haven't solved the Riemann hypothesis or the P versus NP problem. Um, we don't throw out all the laws of physics and go jumping off bridges because we haven't solved the, you know, um, the cosmology of the universe yet. Um, and so from a Muslim perspective, this is the method God chose to preserve in an infant wisdom for a reason that he understands. Um, my advice is people, you know, learn this in detail before entering into argumentation, you know, or just, you know, refer people back um, to the sources. Um, so I'm going to stop, uh, you know, sharing at this point. Um, and do you have any questions? You know, I think it's best not to have any questions. I mean, that, that was excellent, Michael. I truly appreciate it. So if you want, you can just, um, let's end the recording and then we'll talk after. Okay. So well, thank, thank you. For you. Having thank me. you very much. Yes. Thank you. Salam. Salam alaikum.